Um, yeah, good morning. Um, this talk is um, entirely chemical. So uh, those chemists amongst you, I apologize if there isn't uh, enough de detail in the chemistry. And those of you who aren't chemists, I apologize that there's too much detail. Um, so this is solvatochromic dyes detect the presence of homeopathic potencies. Um, the aims of the present research really are to, as I say, develop chemical systems which are able to follow the potentization process and begin to ask really the, the, the questions that matter, well, to my mind, that matter, like what are potencies and how do they work? Um, and to this end, uh, we've developed a range of environment-sensitive dyes uh, which are able to uh, respond to changes in their environment in the uh, visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so what is a solvatochromic dye? Um, it's a dye that's subject to um, what's known as an intramolecular electron transfer, ongoing from its ground or resting state to an excited state as a result of interaction with light. So basically an electron goes from an electron donor part of the molecule through an electron bridge to an electron acceptor part of the, um, the molecule. And these are two examples. Um, the, the top one is, is in its ground state zwitterionic, so that it's got a positive charge and a negative charge. And when, it, when a photon hits it, it goes into an excited state where it's, it's uh, not charged. And uh, conversely, um, dyes that are uncharged in the ground state, when they're irradiated, go to a charged state in their excited um, state. So basically what happens in, 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 in the presence of light is an electron is going backwards and forwards several hundred million times a second. So one has an oscillating dipole. And this is what's special about these dyes when it comes to their interaction with potencies. So only solvatochromic dyes, i.e. those dyes possessing an oscillating dipole, appear to be able to detect potencies. All ordinary dyes, and I've looked at many, um, are insensitive to potencies. And only a limited number of solvatochromic dyes display changes which are of a magnitude to be useful. Um, those of you who are chemists, uh, here are a list of the ones that have been looked at so far. There's, there's 17 solvatochromic dyes. And the ones I've starred are those that uh, produce a, a reasonable change in the presence of potencies. There's some very exotic dyes here for those who are, who are interested. Some of them are used in, um, in lasers and so on. So um, these are four dyes I'll sort of focus on initially. Um, I, I've given them their, their sort of common names that they're referred to in the literature. Um, they have, obviously, uh, chemical names are much longer than that. But there are three um, dyes that are zwitterionic in their ground state and one dye that's uh, zwitterionic in its uh, excited state. And you'll see that there's a complementary um, sort of difference between how they respond to, to potencies. Um, just before I show you results, I'll just say that these studies have been done in, in a number of different solvents, but primarily they've been done in water, ethanol, and tertiary butyl alcohol. Um, the reason for that is that you get a decreasing hydrogen bonding capacity in going from water to tertiary butyl alcohol. So I thought it was very important to address this issue um, because that there's, a, there's a common sort of view that water is special and that water is necessary to see some kind of homeopathic effect. And it might be that water isn't so essential. Um, there's a decreasing solvent polarity in going from water to tertiary butyl alcohol, and there's e increasing solvent hydrophobicity. Um, the next thing is that um, throughout the study that I'll, I'll, I'll show you, um, only one remedy has been used. That's glycerol 50M. And there are all kinds of reasons uh, why that choice has been made, and I can't go into all of them um, in, in the 15 minutes I have. But I just say that similar results have been obtained with all the remedies tested so far, and that's been over 40 um, in different potencies. Um, but focusing on one remedy at one potency allows strict comparisons to be made between different dyes and different solvent systems. And, and this is something about sort of a chemical approach, is that um, you, you can hold everything down, so there's one variable at a time. And that's what makes chemical systems so different from um, sort of living systems, where there are so many variables, um, you, you don't know sort of how many are varying at any one time. So the other thing I need to say, because this is important, is that, uh, that those dyes that are zwitterionic in the ground state uh, form aggregates in solution, that is, they order, and those orders are, are bathochromically or red-shifted with respect to unaggregated dye, and those dyes having a zwitterionic excited state form aggregates that are 
blue shifted with respect to an aggregated dye. So th this will become obvious when I show you the next slide, which is a spectrum of, of one of the dyes, which is vitriolinic in the ground state, called ET33. Um, and what it shows is that, um, and I'll show you in the next slide in more detail, but basically in the presence of potency, there's a decrease at around 540 nanometers and an increase at 440 nanometers. And you'll notice that it's asymmetric, um, which means there's something very odd going on in solution. This is a different spectrum between uh, dye plus control and dye plus potency. And you'll see what's happening is that, um, is that there's, there's a decrease at around 540, an increase at 440. And because this is a zvitronic dye in the ground state, that means that potencies are decreasing the level of aggregation in solution because there's a blue shift. Um, not only that, the time course of the change um, is, is not immediate. I mean, it's a slow build-up and then a slow decline over several minutes. I mean, it maxes at about 150 minutes and then declines so that overnight uh, there's no difference. So that, that's very interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that. If, if, if we can hypothesize then that the, the, the dye is um, disaggregating in the presence of potency, then an independent experiment would be to say, okay, we know that these dyes uh, interact with divalent cations like strontium, and when they do that, they lose their absorbance. So if the potency is enhancing disaggregation, the dye should be more sensitive to the presence of strontium ions. And in fact, that's indeed what happens. In the presence of strontium ions plus potency, the, um, the red graph there shows that there's a greater decrease in absorbance, whereas the control, um, that there's less decrease in absorbance. So that, that, that shows that, um, that potencies are um, lowering aggregation levels. Um, this is another dye, ET30, which is similar. Um, again, it's vitionic in the ground state. And in the presence of potency, it shows a decrease at 715 nanometers and an increase at 580. And this is a different spectrum, which is a particularly nice spectrum. I like that one. Um, again, you can see that there's, a, there's a, a blue shift, a decrease in the red end and a, an increase at the, the blue end. So again, potencies are, are stimulating this dye to disaggregate in solution. Um, the next dye, is also zvitrionic in the ground state, but is, is more interesting because um, when you add potency, you get three changes. There's an increase at around 570, a de an increase at 500, and a decrease at 404. So when you show the different spectrum, you can see that, uh, yes, there's this peak at around um, 570, there's this increase here at 500 and the decrease at 404. If you go back and look at the, the, the scan of the dye itself, there's very little absorbance at 500. But in the presence of potency, that 500 peak is disproportionately increased. Now, I'll just quickly go into a bit more chemistry. Um, it's probable that this peak here it represents monomer in solution. This represents dimer and this represents trimer. So that potencies are preferentially trying to produce dimer in solution rather than trimer. That is, they're, they're trying to bring the solution to some kind of equilibrium. Um, and we'll see that again later when, when I show you some other slides. But that, that's a particularly interesting result. I mean, there's a kind of view in science that it's all about eureka, but actually it's much more about, oh, that's interesting, that's, that's odd, that shouldn't be happening. And that's how sort of science um, develops. And that is definitely uh, one of those, oh, that's an odd thing to happen. Um, and actually, that will turn out to be something really important. So next slide. Um, oh, let me just go back and just explain um, what we see here. In distinction to the first two dyes, this is, this is zwitrionic in the ground state. But in, in distinction, um, it's not showing a decrease at the red end. It's showing an increase at the red end and a decrease at the blue end. So in other words, potencies are causing this dye to aggregate more, so in the opposite direction to the first two dyes. Um, next dye is, is the one that's vitronic in the excited state, so it's opposite to the first three. And again, what you see is, um, is a, a decrease 
at 615 and an increase at, uh, five, at four, 480. So when you look at the different spectrum, there's a very sharp decrease at, uh, at 615 and, a, and an increase at um, around 480. And because this dye is, is switch ionic in the excited state, it means that um, potencies are causing this dye to aggregate more because it's displaying a blue shift. And that's, that's opposite to dyes that are, that are um, switch ionic in the, in the ground state. So basically we have... Um, Oh, no, uh, this, this just, um, again, uh, verifies that the dye is, is being aggregated by potency because in the presence of strontium ions, you get less of, of an increase in absorbance. In other words, uh, strontium ions are less able to interact with the dye because it's more aggregated. So again, it, it, it's, it's supporting the, the different spectra evidence. So it's all very neat and, and, and satisfying. Um, so why do some dyes have their aggregation levels enhanced by potency, and for other dyes, the opposite occurs? Um, the answer isn't immediately obvious, but um, further sort of studies, uh, I think, provide an answer. If you look at these three dyes, they, they form a sort of series. They're structurally similar, but there, there are differences as you progress from left to right. And the figures underneath represent how tightly the dyes aggregate. So the, the lower the number, the more tightly the, the dye aggregates. Um, this dye at the left here has a, a, a dissociation constant of 5 micromolar. And dissociation constant really just means the level at which there's 50% of the dye aggregated and 50% disaggregated. Um, the next dye is, is higher, it's 30 micromolar. So this dye is less aggregated in solution. And then this dye, which we've just looked at, um, has a high dissociation constant. That's 300 micromolar. So it's much more loosely aggregated. So what happens to these three dyes when um, one adds potency? Well, the first dye that uh, aggregates tightly shows increased disaggregation. In other words, the aggregation level drops. This dye, it sort of drops a little bit, um, but this dye, it reverses. So the, one, the dye that, that binds loosely to itself has its aggregation level increased by potency, whereas these all decrease in, in aggregation levels with potency. This can be, can be verified again using three other dyes in which we've looked at at the beginning. Um, again, aggregate, uh, the KD is 5 micromolar, 5 micromolar, and greater than 250 micromolar. So these um, self-associate tightly. This one self-associates loosely. And when we look at the data in the presence of potency, the two that associate tightly are both encouraged to disaggregate with potency. The dye that aggregates loosely is encouraged to um, aggregate more. So potency somehow is recognizing how tightly the dye aggregates in solution and then is adjusting the solution accordingly. So um, a, a sort of verification of that is that we could, we could postulate um, that as, as the dissociation constant is dependent upon concentration, that as, as dye concentration increases, then aggregation level should increase. But in the presence of potency, we should see that at low dye concentrations, potency should increase aggregation levels, and at high dye concentrations, uh, potency should decrease dye levels aggregation. And in fact, I, I, I haven't shown you any results on this slide because this is really the most recent, um, but results so far are definitely showing that to be the case, that, that potencies are acting differently um, depending upon the, the, the pre-existing level of order in solution. So the conclusions are, first of all, that intramolecular electron transfer is necessary for a dye potency interaction to take place. Ordinary dyes don't show any difference whatsoever. Um, as the intramolecular electron transfer feature constitutes an oscillating dipole, this suggests in turn that potencies may also be oscillating dipoles, that, and that interaction occurs through e electron resonance. Surprisingly, solvent has little or no effect on the interaction. Very similar results are obtained in water, ethanol, and tertiary butyl alcohol. So it would appear that potencies are interacting directly with the dye. And I think this, this also um, probably uh, relates to what Alex was saying about necessity for salt in solution. 
that these dyes are naturally uh, charged. Um, I mean, I use, I use purified solvents, including purified water, um, but I get results because the dyes are, are charged. So it's a kind of an interesting thing that, that, that fits together there. Uh, more conclusions. Um, the, the intramolecular electron transfer and potency interaction results in changes in the supramolecular chemistry of solvatochromic dyes. So the aggregation or ordering is either enhanced or diminished in the presence of potency. And that's a really interesting result. I mean, I don't know any mundane explanation that, that could account for that. I mean, whether aggregation is enhanced or diminished by potency depends upon the pre-existing level of dye ordering in solution. Dyes that are excessively ordered, that is, they, they aggregate tightly, have their level of order reduced by potency, whereas dyes that are, are, are much less ordered and, and aggregate less tightly have their level of order increased by potency. I mean, that's, to me, that, that's just unheard of. So basically, the greater the displacement from a balanced central equilibrium position, the greater the effect of potency. I mean, uh, to me, that's reminiscent of what happens in clinical practice, that, that the more someone is displaced from a central equilibrium position, the more effect a potency will have. So it might be that what we're seeing in solution is a reflection of what happens on a much higher level with, with, with patients. Uh, conclusions three. Um, the potency dye interaction occurs and, and, and may well possibly occur through electron resonance. Um, the oscillating dipole of solvatic chromic dyes are then modulated by that potency by, through the interaction. And if, if, the, if the dipole's affected in these dyes, then that always results in a change in aggregation levels. So that's what we see. We see a shift in, in the spectra of the dyes. Um, future directions, uh, delineating dye structural features and conditions necessary to maximize potency effects. And, and, and progress has been made in that direction so that hopefully we'll be able to sort of move to 10 or 20 percent difference or more between controls and, uh, and, and, um, and, and potency solutions. I mean, quite possibly using low dye concentrations, we could move to 50 or 100 percent difference, which would make um, a great difference. Um, then it would be possible to investigate the whole range of potencies from 12C to CM. Uh, results there so far indicate nonlinear effects, which is uh, what other people have seen as well. Um, a number of, of dyes display aggregation-sensitive fluorescent excitation in emission spectra, um, and so fluorescent spectroscopy would add a, a whole batch of new data there. And uh, the, the, the other thing is that utilizing the, the time scale of the spectroscopic changes, I think one of the early slides I showed you, there was an increase in the difference and then a slow decline. Um, I think it may be possible to be able to start differentiating between remedies, uh, particularly fast-acting remedies like aconite and slow-acting remedies like alumina, for instance, um, because the, the, the increase in difference and decline um, should have a different time scale. And finally, if potencies are oscillating dipoles, then under appropriate conditions, they should luminesce. Um, and I think there are ways of possibly catching that um, which would demonstrate the emission of photons by, by, pot by potencies. Um, I think that's it. Oh, oh wider relevance. Um, all biochemical processes in the human body involve electron transfers. I mean, everything that goes on in the human body involves uh, the movement of electrons. So if potencies are interacting with um, the, the uh, solvatic chromic dyes, then they may also be interacting with many bio biochemical processes. The only difference is that with solvatic chromic dyes, we can actually see it happening. And finally, just to uh, thank everyone, especially the HRI, for, for um, their cash injection. Um, and uh, thanks also for, for, to Alex for helpful discussions and comments. Thank you.